Hello everyone and welcome to yet another live here on the channel. I'm Lizzie Daly, your host for today. If you were here last time, welcome back. You are not going to want to miss this next live with our very special guest today. Um, but if you're new around here, hello, I'm a wildlife biologist and a wildlife TV presenter from the beautiful UK here today. The sun is on our side and um, for a good reason because um, we have a really exciting live coming up. And for those who didn't know, it's International Snake Day today. So happy International Snake Day. Um, and we thought we'd celebrate it by talking about venom. I mean, what better way to celebrate today? And um, we're gonna be learning all about venomous species and chatting to an expert who probably is one of the most accomplished when it comes to looking at some of the world's most venomous and deadly species from across the world. Now remember, um, please do get your questions into us live. I want to hear from you. Tell me about your most you know, favourite venomous snake, favourite venomous species. Perhaps you've had an encounter with a venomous species in the wild. I'll always remember last year when I was in the primary rainforest of Borneo, coming face to face with this nocturnal beautiful primate, the slow loris. Now don't be fooled by those fantastic big nocturnal eyes. The slow loris is actually the world's only venomous primate. It's also one of the most primitive primates, um, but actually it secretes toxins in its upper arm and you'll often see them kind of licking their armpits which when mixed with saliva all the, those toxins basically can cause a really severe allergic reaction um, and they actually end up coating their young in this saliva to protect them from predators. I mean, venom has so many capabilities and we have lots of different types of venom in the animal kingdom, which we're going to be learning about today. So exciting. So I'm not an expert. Someone who is an expert on this is biomedical scientist Zoltan Tkach. Now, he really has been everywhere studying venomous species across the world. But really what he does is he looks at the genetic blueprint of these toxins and essentially builds up a library of this and uses it to and applies it um, to actually looking at um, medicines, novel medicines. I mean, how incredible is that? And so he doesn't just go face to face with the world's most deadly and venomous species, but he, as a scientist, he then takes all this um, understanding of this venom and these toxins and applies it to real world applications that involves every single one of us watching here today. And he has crossed the world. He's been to the Sahara, to Micronesia. You see videos of him everywhere, you know, deep under the water, finding venomous snakes um, everywhere he has been. And he's actually here with us live right now. So Zoltan, welcome. It's so good to have you on. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Lizzie. You, I mean, just reading about you, it's just you've done so much. And um, of course, I missed there that you're a National Geographic explorer as well. You know, you're renowned in your field. But Zoltan, I have to ask you, why venom? I mean, why venomous species? Is that a silly question? <laughs> well, I just follow my childhood passion. Actually, I'm in Hungary right now. I'm a Hungarian and I'm born here. And the first venomous snakes I ever caught in my life was just a few kilometers from here back long, long time ago. I was a high school student, the first year of the, uh, the high school. And I'm just fascinated about nature. I'm fascinated yeah. about the beauty and the unknown in nature. So this is drives me, this is drives me into science and into exploration. I find it beautiful and, and very rewarding. And so, so for you, I mean, you, you've literally traveled the world and come face to face with many different venomous species, but um, let, let's actually talk about what, what venom is. People have a perception of venom, but, but why is it so important? Well, why, let's start it. why this is so important. Some of the top medications in the world used by every major hospital are coming from venoms. Out of the top three medications used for the most lethal types of heart attacks, two of them are coming from snake venom. One of the most often prescribed medication used by 40 million patients all over the world coming from snake venom. One of a leading uh, group of medicines used for diabetes coming from a lizard venom. So they're really a very major medications, life savers, literally life savers. And, and so why, the, why this is happening? There are 150,000 venomous animal species in the earth snakes, spiders, uh, jellyfish, uh, corals, insects, and, and lots of them all over the planet. They have 20 million toxins combined. 
20 million wow. toxins, most of them unstudied by science. So why do they have so many toxins? Because evolution made venoms into these venomous animals to kill a prey or predator in less than one minute. Venom toxins, toxins are the components of the venom, are the only molecules in the entire universe designed by nature to take a life in less than one minute. So wow. how do they do that? They target very important parts of the human body or, or the other animal bodies, uh, like nervous system, circulation. The same targets what you have to take under control in order to treat diseases. So that's why there's such a good templates. Nature evolution perfected them for millions of years that target vital receptors in the human body and they are very precision binders. They bind with high affinity and very selective. So it's really, it's a gold mine for medicine. Yeah, and it sounds like such a big field. And I definitely want to come on to later on a, um, a little bit more about what you do in the lab, but kind of bring it back down to, I mean, it's International Snake Day, so happy International Snake Day. And you've Thank worked you with them. <laughs> um, let me ask you, what, what deadly snakes have you worked with? Or I should say venomous snakes have you worked with? Well, I... As a, as a kid, as a high school kid, I started to catch vipers right here in, in the middle of Hungary. Then I moved to, to, down to Bulgaria in a summer vacation for vi catching vipers there. And then I get bold. I went to the U.S., you know, get my first rattlesnakes uh, in, the, in the western U.S. And then I moved to Vietnam. I mean, went to Vietnam and Africa. And so I seen everything from sea snakes to rattlesnakes, from black mambas to desert vipers. I like them all. So uh, is snakes the kind of the, the species that you work with the most or you mentioned that, you know, jelly, um, uh, jellyfish are obviously venomous, but venom comes in many different forms across different groups. So like for you, what are you most passionate about? Wh which group? Well, there's not a single group which I'm really passionate about because, you know, for science, we focus on those venomous animals. And I mentioned there are 150,000 different species. So it's a huge uh, arsenal. We focus on those species which have a particular type of toxins which we can use to target that particular receptor in the human body which is important to treat a disease. So let's say, I'm telling you an example, right now we have a major project on, on scorpion venoms which target uh, autoimmune disorders or scorpion venoms which target cancer. So we're looking for those kinds of venomous animals which have these kind of toxins blocking potassium channels or uh, target receptors or cells uh, involved in cancer treatment. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, this is real world applications is absolutely uh, incredible. And of course, this research that you do takes you all over the world. So tell us about some of your most memorable expeditions that you've been on. Well, there are many, you know, so I've been to 198 countries. And before I'm getting there, I, I just have to point out that I mentioned how uh, major lifesavers could be the snake venoms and other uh, venoms from uh, animal species. But on the other hand, they're also one of the deadliest creatures on earth. So they snake bites, they kill 100,000 people around the globe each year. 100,000 people die from snake bite every year. And they die because we, they cannot afford antivenom. Mm -hmm. We have the perfect technology and knowledge to how to make antivenom, but it just, uh, you know, for from financial reasons, you know, most of was the tropical uh regions you know where snake bites are are, are peaking they cannot afford antivenom so this is really life savers and also some of the deadliest toxins at the same time and i have to be careful as i'm searching for these snakes because of course i can be bitten and i've been bitten a number of times and those are of my faults yes unfortunately mm -hmm. and so so th th this is sort of the settings when we go into the, the adventures in, in in the field so in order to go to the field, first of all, we have to decide what kind of toxins we're looking for and where we're going. So we, we try to time our presence in the field, normally at the starting of the rainy seasons when you see the highest amount of activity in, in venomous animals. Uh, we don't wanna go in the middle of the winter because it's too cold or in the middle of the summer, it's too hot. And so once in a location, I love to team up with local people, local tribes, like in Congo, the Boko Pygmies. They mm -hmm. taught me 
what I do if elephants are coming in the rainforest in the middle of night, you know? So what you do, you hear the elephants trumpeting, you just run and you hide in the buttresses of the trees. Now the problem, they're half of my size, you know, I'm a, I'm a tall Hungarian. <laughs> so we were sort of fighting, you know, uh, for the, uh, the hiding place, you know, in the, in the buttresses of the tree in the middle of the night in the Congo rainforest. And I have to be careful because a colleague of mine actually died in that spot, uh, you know, from an elephant. They also taught me yeah. how I can get water from lions in the, in the middle of the rainforest. You just cut it, you know, and, and then you can drink yeah. it. Drink or it. Yeah. what you do to get water, uh, sorry, to, to, to end proof your home. So keep the ends away. You throw ash all around. Now, I sleep normally in a hammock. So what I do, okay. I, I do my fire, you know, it's a kitchen, you know, it's very easy in the, uh, in the rain for us to remodel. If you don't like it, you just uh, put it a couple of meters away. And then you, I collect ash and I throw it on the trunk of the tree. So it completely stops the ants from coming. And I learned this from, from the bark of pygmies. So I love to team up with local people because they can teach you so much uh, knowledge. Like in Pakistan, snake charmers can, uh, told me that if a parent take a kid to them and say, well, this kid was bitten by a snake. Is it venomous or not? Do you know what they do? They get their knife, they make a cut across the, the, the bite mark, fang marks, and they keep the blood between their fingertips. One, two, three, then they right. part it. If it's sticky and, 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 and gummy, then it forms from a venomous snake. If it's not, then it's from a non-venomous snake. And I said, wow, this is interesting. They just explained me that the snake venom, the viper venom makes the blood to coagulate, to clot. So I love to team up with local people. So again, we have to get there in the right place, the right season. I make friends with local tribes. And then I set up my campsite. As I mentioned, I normally sleep in a hammock. It's, yep. it's the easiest to put it up. And you know what's the biggest danger in the rainforest? Go on. What's the biggest danger? Hmm? Venomous species. <laughs> no. I wish. I wish those were there. No. The biggest <laughs> danger in the rainforest are the falling tree branches. So you have yeah. to put up your hammock, but not, nothing going to fall on your head, which is actually not that much. Mm. Uh, so, so, yes, go ahead. I was just going to ask you, Zoltan, because, I mean, this is incredible. I'm sure many people watching are just like, this is amazing what you do you kind of integrate yourself in these environments but let's say you head to an environment with the idea of finding a particular species how do you go about doing that um, how are i heading into the environment or, or how do you how do you actually find that species um specifically and then how would you go about actually learning about that species venom and those toxins Okay, so there's no magic bullet, so there's no guarantee. Sometimes I'm in that location in the Sahara or in Congo or in Amazon, and I've spent a week or two and we don't find that snake. Sometimes yeah. we're lucky. In Amazon, you know, we find a bushmaster, like a 2.4 meter, eight feet long bushmaster. And actually I tried to put in a bag and yeah. the snake just shoot out like a rocket. So it was wow. a good warning sign to me that Zoltan, you still have uh, stuff to learn. You know, I'm still on a learning curve. Yeah. And so, so there is no guarantee that we're going to find that snake. So basically, you just start to look. Like the middle viper lives in a place like, you know, this, this plain Hungarian plains in, uh, next to the Hungarian National Parks uh, around me. Uh, you just have to keep looking. Like if I'm looking for sea snakes, I go to a location. I go to the Pacific Ocean or I go Indian Ocean or, or Panama. I hire a fishing man, you know, with a boat. And I say, I'm going to look for a fishing, a, a sea snake. Mm -hmm. And then he thinks I'm completely crazy. But when I, he <laughs> actually sees me to jump from the boat for the snake, then he's actually convinced that I'm crazy. Uh, so, and I mobilize the village. I normally tell that I team up with local hunters and wildlife officers, scientists. And I sort of mobilize the whole village and say, guys, if anybody spots a venomous creature, let yeah. me know. If we look for scorpions, that's much easier because all you have to do, you just switch on the UV light. And if you don't, don't like scorpions, don't take UV light to the desert because you're going to be very disappointed. <laughs> so like you go to the Sahara, you, put, you know, I switch on the UV light and I just pick up the scorpions. In, in one night, you can pick up easily like 20, 30 or more. But <laughs> wow. in the Sahara, you know, it's a, such a fascinating place. I took off yeah. my shoes. You know, I was there last time in, uh, I think, November. 
And I said, okay, I'm just relaxing. So I was just walking in, this is where Algeria, Niger, and Libya meet with each other. Walking in the sand, in nighttime, I enjoyed myself a lot, picking up the scorpions. <laughs> Next morning, I slept there right in the middle of the nowhere. Next morning, I go for a walk, and I just see the sand viper tracks right next from my camp. So I said, well, oh, it's good. I was lucky that, you know, I didn't step on one of these sand vipers uh, uh, yes. walking around me. Yeah. Let's put that down to you being um, a biomedical scientist with a lot of experience. <laughs> um, so uh, what would be quite, I mean, you mentioned your habitat and the fact that this is where it all started. Tell me about where you are at the moment. It looks fantastic. So this is interesting. And you mentioned this is the International Snake Day. So one, one of the most endangered subspecies of venomous snakes lives right here. Wow. It's called the middle viper, that's the species, and there's a subspecies uh, which is uh, uh, only found in this geographical region in Hungary and a couple of places immediately surroundings. This is where it lives. So it's, and, and unfortunately, the biggest threat to venomous creatures and other animals in general are the habitat destructions. I mentioned yeah. I love nature and there are 150,000 venomous species, 20 million toxins we discussed us. This one depends on a healthy biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And if we destroy these habitats, we wipe out this uh, uh, species and this potential to develop new medications. So yeah. this is good. There's a Hungarian National Park here, which protects the viper, and hopefully it will be surviving here for many, many generations. Yeah, and I guess, um, I mean, you were talking about the fact that you first caught it when you were age, you know, 14 years old. So in your lifetime, even, I'm sure you've seen big changes. Um, but yeah, I mean, what an incredible uh, snake species to have on your Door, doorstep it's just such a shame that we're seeing this obviously with a lot of our species but hey I'm, am I right in saying you potentially may have a meadow viper with you oh yeah I can show you oh my gosh please you? yeah that'll be fantastic so okay just give me a second I will be here no problem for everyone still watching uh, you can see now a meadow viper on screen beautiful beautiful snake um that Zoltan has live that's what we do here on the channel we get live vipers <laughs> um so this is the middle viper wow it's a quite small snake and you see that zigzag band on on the back it's Beautiful. venomous so i can't afford to get bitten i've been bitten by this species before uh, i'm allergic to the snake venom and to the snake antivenom so i'm not in a good position to get bitten here but this is the middle yeah. viper so and and what you what you look right now is as i mentioned one of the most endangered snake in the whole world. And my colleagues and friends here just next door, they have a breeding facility where they actually breed these snakes and they, they're released to the wild just to try to maintain the population with as much, as, as much support as possible. So, sorry, just to go over that, you're allergic to the antivenom. I'm allergic to the snake venom and to the anti snake antivenom. So wow, I'm in the okay. least good position to be a snake venom researcher. Mm -hmm holding a meadow viper right now <laughs> but nevertheless an absolute yeah. beauty i have to say and and it's and you'd nice be... snake. Yeah, i used it's to keep beautiful. this of snakes at home actually when i grew up there were three people in hungary who had permit to keep, because this, is, this snake is a protected species three people had a permit to keep this snake and i was one of them of course absolutely so it's a very and... nice snake and it's this is the habitat it is the hungarian plain this is untouched here and and I wish you know, most of the world wildlife would, I mean, the wilderness would be so untouched as, as right here yeah. around us. Yeah. And for those who, who are watching that may not know too much about vipers, what kind of, hab where would you actually find these vipers? I'm guessing either basking out in the sun or under kind of stones or sheets, things like that. Yeah, that's correct. They, they like the sun. So the first snake, as I mentioned, was, was uh, back in a long time ago. It's in the 1983, uh, 1st of May or 2nd of May, like in the beginning of May, there was this uh, International Workers' Day or whatever, you know, holidays. So I said, it's a good excuse to come to the field and look for vipers and we get lucky. So you find this snake um, in the habitat around me. And you just yeah. keep go going. And if you're yeah. alone, your chances are lower. And if you have a couple of friends or colleagues, 
then you sort of form a line and, and you go in and then, you know, when you yeah. see one, then you just scream, snake. And <laughs> then everybody runs there. It's, it's really, yeah, but... it's, it's, really it's, 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 it's a very nice feeling to find, find a snake. And I find them absolutely beautiful. And what mm -hmm. we do with these snakes, uh, not, the, not just the middle viper, but, you know, in the generally the venomous snakes and other venomous animals, is that we sampling the genetic blueprint of their toxins. Because yeah. it doesn't matter how great technology we have in the lab, mm -hmm. what kind of cutting edge instruments and, and scientists working in my group, I need to come to the nature and extract the genetic blueprint of their toxins, which we take back to the lab. So how we do that? We, we, we don't kill the snakes we don't take it back to the lab, but we take a tiny amount of tissue sample. And from that tissue, we put it in a, in a, in a, in a small tube uh, with some kind of liquid, which makes it to, to last for a couple of weeks, comes back to the lab. In the lab, we extract the DNA, the genetic blueprint uh, of, of everything. And from the DNA sequence, we fish out the toxin genes and now we have the blueprint of the toxins. And then comes bioinformatics. In the computer, we designed the largest toxin libraries, literally like a million, two million and, and, and more uh, toxin variants in this library. And wow. then we screen which one out of those million uh, strong library is best targeting for a receptor which could be used to take a disease under control. So yep. it's, it's really fascinating. The whole uh, research is based on the wisdom of nature. I, I you know, I, I joke it that you know we, we, we utilize nature's wisdom here, and and this is tied to biodiversity, tied to conservation. Absolutely, and it's yeah. I mean, the applications of it is is incredible. And can can it treat or or be for a variety of medicines? You mentioned the huge variety of toxins, but are we talking everything, um, from you know cancer to to all to all types of diseases? That's correct. Because again, so I, I keep coming back to how many different venomous animals are in the world, like snakes, spiders, scorpions, lizards, lots of marine creatures. Uh, and they all live in a different environment. But yeah. what they need, immobilize and kill prey and predator as quickly as possible. Mm. So the venom is a mixture of, let's say, 50, 100 different toxins. So imagine you have this many different animals living from Congo to the Himalaya, from, from Polynesia to, to, the, to the Sahara. So their toxins target a little bit different receptors everywhere. So that's why you have this huge diversity and that's good for, for medicine and, 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 uh, and, and research because that means that all of them is a little bit different. They target a little bit different receptor, you know, they yep. have a little bit different action and that, that's just like a huge gold mine for medicine. Mm -hmm. Many different Raina, stages to I'm your sorry, job. Just, Raina, it's, it's, I, we, we were discussing what kind of medications are in clinic, I mean, clinical use at this moment. But there are other medications on the pipeline. So in clinical trials, there are medications from animal venom, from a shrew venom, actually, for cancer. There is another wow. one from a sea anemone venom for autoimmune disorders. There is another wow. one for heart failure from the black mambo venom. Wow. Yeah, so a real variety then. Gosh, that's absolutely incredible. And your, your job, I mean, it's many different faces, doesn't it, really, from being in the lab to being out in the field. I can see from where you are currently, you're sat on a lot of kit. And I was wondering if you've got anything in there that you could show us a little bit more um, to tell us more about how you would actually go about taking those tissue samples. So all, all of these cases normally, it just makes me possible to to camp out, you know, so I have uh, food, I have sleeping bags and equipments, you know, I, I, I like to take pictures. Uh, this is the, this is the, this is actually the key to, to sample something. So it's a small uh, case and it's, it's very low tech. So it doesn't, it, it, things cannot go wrong easily. Uh, I have different solutions. Yeah, because I, I mean- have syringes you, and needles. So I get the snake, what, how, if I get a tissue sample from a snake, I get the snake, I put the snake head into a tube. 
So okay. these are deadly snakes and I don't want to get bitten. So I, I just slide okay. the snake head into a tube. No, I can safely handle the snake. Yeah. And I get, you know, one of these, one of these needles and that insert directly to the heart. It's completely okay. fine. This is, this is how the, the vets are doing if, if they're sampling uh, blood from a snake. Mm -hmm. And then I get a, a couple of drops of blood directly from the snake because from that blood, you can extract the DNA. Mm -hmm. the genetic blueprint so this is what we're taking back the snake is of course it doesn't hurt the snake the process is not going to die we just release the snake and we're coming back with with, with two small tubes small tubes mm -hmm. you know each, each of them containing some tissue sample from snakes spiders scorpions you name it wow yeah that's fantastic um and i because i was quite interested to know actually how you take those samples so yeah i mean gosh what a the job biggest problem the biggest problem with the samples is that because hurdle is, of course, uh, we need permits. So you cannot just show up uh, in, in Vietnam and say, OK, I'm going to start catching snakes and bring the samples out, which is completely normal. But uh, in some instances, you know, it takes like a year or two to get the permits. You need a permit to catch a snake and you need a permit to take out the tissue sample from the country and, you know, sometimes to export, uh, export from the country and to import to uh, your destination. Yeah. And what's your next big project? Where are you heading to next or what venomous species are you going to find? Well, who knows in the current situation, but uh, situation. I, have pending, I have pending, I have projects which are on hold for to the Sahara, Northern Congo, uh, Sudan and Pakistan. And what will you be seeing in Sudan out of interest? I, as I mentioned, we, we, we look for anything, anything which has venom, we catch it. Wow. But we, right now, we, we target, we target uh, which I can say publicly, we target uh, uh, those species which has uh, uh, potassium channel blocking toxins, yes. those species which block uh, sodium channel because we have a, a project on chronic pain okay. uh, and, and uh, so pain. And there is a couple of other toxins we target. Um, yeah, fantastic. And every, now... Um, just before we get on, we've already got questions flooding in and I'll get to those very shortly. But just before we do, um, I, I, we kind of covered, obviously, the fantastic applications of your research and, and why it's so important. But the other side of it, I guess, is this side that people mostly associate with venom is that it is deadly. So can we talk a little bit about the different types of venom, you know, the in a jellyfish, how the nematocyst, how does that work compared to like a snake or compared to a scorpion? Um, let's start with jellyfish. I mean, you've studied jellyfish before. Yeah, so we, basically what we did, you know, my, my, my work with jellyfish is limited, in some sense is limited, but on the other sense is quite extensive because we happen to make the largest toxin library coming from that group of animals in the area where the jellyfish is, is, is belonging to. So we made a library of, uh, I think, 1.5 million toxins and uh, it's... Wow. that library successfully yielded uh, novel toxins for for ion channels, which does, didn't have a, a, a ligand. A ligand is another molecule. We specifically recognize those uh, receptors. But basically, the major difference between jellyfish that you have lots of small stinging cells. And you know, that's, that gets around your, the, your body, you know, like millions of those stinging cells. And th th that's how the venom gets into you. In a snake, you have two fangs and those gonna inject you like a spoonful of amount of venom. One of the snake, which has the largest amount of venom is the gaboon viper. And yes. let me tell you a story. I was then in Congo having my siesta in the in, in afternoon and the bulk of pygmies I mentioned earlier, they run up to you, they run up to me, I'm sorry. And uh, I say, Sultan, come quickly, Coco Poo Poo, Coco Poo Poo. And I said, what the hell is Coco Poo Poo? You know what's Coco Poo Poo? Coco Poo is the coolest snake in the world, the gaboon viper. So we were running, like I said, Coco Poo run on uh, gaboon viper. I was running into the rainforest deep, and then we stopped. I said, there is it. And I was catching snakes since high school, so I, I seen a couple snakes. And I said, where the hell is it? And then no. I saw it. It was so camouflaged, and we digged out from the leaf litter in the forest. It's just like huge gaboon viper. Wow. The head was so big that I could not fit the snake head into the tubes what I had with me. So what I tried, I get a water bottle 
cut off the hair, the, the top of the water bottle, and try to put the snake head into the water bottle, it will not fit. It was so big. So what I had to do, I actually, and don't do this one at home, but what I did is I actually hold the snake right behind the head and was just sitting on it like a cowboy, you know, running, you know, riding a horse uh, uh, to, to restrain the gaboon viper. And my helper, who used to be elephant poacher, but no, he reborn and works for the national park. He cut a small amount of tissue from the end of the tail of the snake because it was so big. Mm. So, so this this wow. is the nematocyst, you know, tiny stinging cells, you know, to to a spoonful amount of venom, which is injected by a five centimeter, uh, two inches long fangs into mm. your body. So it, it, it varies quite uh, uh, in, in a wide range. And what the venom does, so the function of the venom is to kill you or immobilize you as quickly as possible. Because either, either the snake or other uh, creature wants to eat you or wants to be protected from you. So yeah. how do I do it? The, the best way to do this one is to shut down the nervous system. Shut down mm -hmm. the system where how the nerve cells communicating with the muscle cells to contract because you immobilize, you get immobilized. The second way, you shut down the circulation. So venom gets injected, your whole blood yep. just freezes. You know, it, it gets, it's coagulated. And, and this again, as I mentioned, it's not one toxin, it's like 50, 100 or, or sometimes more toxins working synergistically in a venom, hand in hand in a venom, just to kill you. To this is what happens in your body. How many times I get this question, how, how soon the venom starts to act once you get bitten? And the venom starts to act right away. The, the moment it gets injected and finds its target, it rides away. How soon you will see the clinical symptoms of the bite, that depends on many factors. How much venom has been injected, injected the body? Uh, what kind of snakes was uh, responsible for the bite? Are you a kid or a larger adult in a many, many uh, uh, factors? Let me tell you an example. I, was in v I work a lot in Vietnam and uh, in the rainy season, which is coming up you know, soon, uh, you go to a hospital and you see patients next to patients by uh, uh, bitten by snakes yeah. and they're in a respiratory paralysis. Mm. They've been bitten by a crate. Crate is the deadlier version of the cobra and mm -hmm. there's no anti-venom in Vietnam. Uh, so they're paralyzed, they cannot breathe their own, they cannot move any, any of, any of their fingers, them. nothing. Yeah. They just yeah. lay motion, motionless. It's just mm. absolutely terrifying to see. They're completely mm -hmm. conscious. They can hear what you say, they, they're aware of their surrounding, but they can communicate. Yeah. So actually, uh, there was one example when I was seeing these patients and I, I said, well, you know, I'm a scientist, I have the international connection. So I called up my buddy who, is a, who was the Hungarian ambassador to Thailand. And I said, dude, do you have 600 euro on you? Because can you just go buy an anti-venom in Thailand? We find a Vietnamese airline pilot who was, I said, I connected them. Yeah. So he tried to bring it to Hanoi. First, it was rejected because it was liquid. But the second yeah. pilot we find was, it's a little bit more, inventive so he was able to bring the liquid antivenom to Hanoi we give it to the patient and save his lives I had tears in my eyes I was so happy you know real applications just incredible it's like from one extreme to another hey it's all time we've got questions flooding in um so we're going to get to a few of those um now thank you all for your questions if you're watching live what incredible talk this has been I'm just so overcome with uh inspiration so first one are the sea snakes you um jumped in the water with to catch poisonous this is an important question isn't it zoltan <laughs> yeah it's uh well we we only we only deal with venomous snakes and i want to make a difference between poison and venom and the short answer the short explanation poison you have to lick it venom you have to be stung by so, inject. so to, yeah, yeah inject you know so the, the def, one of the definition of the venom that it has to be delivered by a physical trauma like a fang or oh we seem to have lost sound on zoltan okay, um thanks. so we'll get him back oh he's back he's back there we go back, yeah and you. i think a lot of people are confused between poisonous and venomous but so there you go everyone um however that being said was that sea snake venomous 
Oh yeah, we, yeah. we only do the venomous <laughs> snakes. I think uh, I, I provided them pictures for you guys, and uh, it's only one of them is I think non venomous snakes, a boa constrictor, because I was just so happy to find one just for a change. <laughs> yeah. Something I can relax myself. Although I think I would be also allergic to the to the a bite of a non venomous snakes because it, it, the saliva and the venom, it's it's there is an overlap. Okay, um, lots of questions. Does venom help cure cancer? You've touched on this already, but tell us more yes. about that. So, so there is no cancer treating venom toxin in clinical uh, approval right now, but at mm -hmm. least there are two toxins which are in clinical trials for cancer. One of them I mentioned is coming from a shrew venom, and I think it's from ovary cancer. And the second one yeah. is coming from a scorpion toxin, where uh, this toxin helps to deliver uh, a, a, mole a huge molecular complex to target cancer cells and kill them. So these are two in clinical trials, and hopefully they will work. Absolutely fantastic. And um, how do you identify a venomous snake from a non-venomous snake? Interesting question. <laughs> it's it's sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it's Oh, hang on. We're just getting Zoltan's um, sound back. Audio. Okay, back, got you. back, back. Got you. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. We are in the middle of the field, and uh, it's, so I'm, it's everyone's I'm ready happy. for it. This is actually a luxury for me because I normally isolate for four weeks in the middle of the Amazon, so I'm not aware of whatever <laughs> happening, and it's actually good because I'm not disturbed by all of those emails. But the, <laughs> so the venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes, the major difference is they have fangs. So if you want to be really sh sh uh, sure you know what's happening, then you catch the snake, you open the mouth and see the fangs. But of course, only if you're an expert, a herpetologist, you should do this one. But most of the other cases, you're able to take a look based on the, on the, on the color, the pattern, the, the, the size of the snake or the shape of the snake. You tell apart which one is venomous and which one is non-venomous snake. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's much more trickier. Uh, you really have to pick up the snake. And, you know, in order to identify two different snake species, most, most of the times people rely on the, on the pattern and the, the number of scales covering the snake. And so that's, that's how, you, how you say it. So characteristics. The best yeah. one, if, if you don't know, you, always, you treat every snake as a venomous. So don't, don't suspect that this is okay, non-venomous. And if you see a venomous snake, do not panic. All you have to do, one, two, three steps backward. You take a picture, end of the story. And in a, in a large arc, you know, you, you can just keep, keep going. If you ever get bitten in the field, the best first aid is the mobile phone. That's the best first aid for snake bite. You call for help as soon as possible for the hospital, to the hospital, as quickly as possible to the hospital. Yeah, and leave it, leave it up to the experts, um, the, any handling or any, any going near it, absolutely. Um, can you explain why some snakes spit? Interesting question. Why some snakes spit? Spit. So I guess... Spitting the venom. Yeah. Well, that, I, I have a good story. So I, uh, I, was, I was trying to photograph uh, mambas, mamba, mamba, uh, small green mambas hatching from the egg. Okay. And I, I was in Europe, and my friends in South Africa could call me Zoltan. The We've lost you again on sound. That's what happens when you come live from the beautiful okay. meadow. Okay, <laughs> okay, back, back in audio. So they called me from my, my colleagues in from South Africa. The mambas are hatching or, or about to hatch. So I sat on a plane, like literally, I heard this one in the morning and in a, like in afternoon, I was on a plane uh, heading to South Africa. Unfortunately, the mambas didn't hatch, but we had spitting cobras. So wow. we, were, we were photographing spitting cobras and I was asking them, so guys, how we stand with water because the best first aid for spitting cobra spot is lots of water. I said, we have none. So we were actually photographing spitting cobras with having zero water around us. And so you have to be careful because if the venom gets spot into your eyes, then it mm -hmm. can cause trouble. So I don't know the, the gentleman, but uh, somebody who I, a friend of mine's friend 
was actually died from a spitting cobra uh, spot. Oh gosh! Uh, yeah. So it's it's there's an evolutionary uh, uh, history, you know, behind. So they can spit the venom. You find spitting cobras in Africa, and a couple of them are are spitting in Asia. Uh, but they still can deliver the venom by bite. So yeah, it, it's the sort of double doubly dangerous. Yeah, great great wall of defense, you know, being able to project that venom. Um, really good question. Uh, really good questions today, I think you'll agree. Um, how do you get samples from spiders? Well, sp spiders, it's again, so it, it, there's two, two ways. Uh, we aim for any kind of tissue because yep. all of the body cells contains DNA. And some of them easier to handle, some of them not. So whatever we can get, sometimes we have to get the venom gland. And if we have to get the venom gland, we have to uh, unfortunately euthanize the animal. But so either we go for the venom gland or, or an, any piece of tissue. For example, from snakes, I mentioned the blood, but you can get even a DNA sample from a shed piece of skin. So any, any tissue, yeah. just like in humans, you know, any tissue, uh, you, you can get the DNA. Fantastic. Um, another good question. Do neurotoxic animals contribute to studies for diseases like multiple sclerosis? So, so multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder. And uh, in autoimmune disorder, there, there, there is a, a, a receptor, uh, you know, which is responsible uh, for... Uh, it's called a validated target. It sits on immune cells. And if you can uh, block those receptors specifically, then uh, the understanding is that you, you can sort of uh, uh, use the symptoms you, uh, of the disease. So mm. we actually come up uh, with a, a, a couple of molecules from Scorpion Toxin Library, you know, which targets uh, this receptor and it it's, it's could be potentially used in autoimmune disorders. But to develop a, a, a drug from toxins to, to FDA approval drug, I tell you real life examples. I think it was from seven to 24 years or something like in that magnitude. So it's a huge long process. The average to, to develop a drug is approximately 10 years. So this is not yep. like a, it doesn't work like that. I go to the it. rainforest, <laughs> yeah. I find a snake, and then two months later, I have a drug. It's, right. I wish it would be that easy. Yes, and I guess kind of twofold that the toxins are really complex, but also the diseases themselves are really complex. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, got another question here. We're actually running out of time, but um, so does that mean a venomous animal from one region is more effective treating disease from that same region? That's interesting. So because <laughs> there's so much diversity of animal species and, and toxins, uh, nobody really knows that which one is good. So yeah. one of the leading heart attack medications used all over the world, it's coming from the pygmy rattlesnake venom, a snake which is not really toxic. I mean, don't get bitten. You have to treat all venomous animals as potentially can kill you. But it's still, you know, the pygmy rattlesnake in, in Florida and in, in the Southeast US is not really like, a, is not considered like a, a really deadly snake. But still, that snake venom gave us one of the major heart attack medications, or the Gila monster venom from Arizona. Again, is the Gila monster? If 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 somebody gets bitten by the Gila monster, chances you're gonna die. It's it's very slight. It's very slim, very minimal. Yeah. Again, don't get bitten because you could die from it. But that venom. Oh. <laughs> It's the Meadow Viper, I'm, I'm guessing. It's causing issues with our sound. Hopefully we'll get Zoltan back just in a moment. Um, but this is part of it, guys. This is what happens when you have a live in the field. No, nope, can't hear you yet, Zoltan. Right, while Zoltan gets his audio back, I mean, thank you all for your questions, firstly, because they are absolutely incredible. Um, and what a fascinating topic, you know, thinking not only about the power of venom and how we know it so well in the natural world in terms of it being deadly and, you know, so efficient and how it kills, but then how we can use it to save lives. I bet you guys didn't think about that. And um, it's something that I think um, to the general public is often overlooked. But of course, scientists, biomedical scientists like Zoltan, um, they really use that kind of 
knowledge and expertise to be able to apply it to our world in, in ways that is just kind of unfathomable. Um, Zoltan, how are you doing with the audio? Hopefully we can get him okay, okay, back. 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 I'm He's back. back. Great. This is so good because we have still a few more questions. But you, you were saying, go on. And I, I guess to kind of summarise that, it, it's not limited to geographical location, is it? So, for example, in Sudan, you wouldn't have a, a lots of species mm -hmm. with um, venom that is good for mm -hmm. disease compared to somewhere else. Yeah, so it's it's so I mentioned the example that the major heart attack medication and the diabetes medication come from a snake, which is not very toxic because mm. most people would think that more toxic snake is better science, so that doesn't work like. And it's similar to geographical distribution. Nobody knows really where you would find that particular toxin which targets that receptor. Now, if you know that you, you're looking for targeting a potassium channel and you know which mm -hmm. kind of animals tend to have potassium channel blocking toxins in the venom, then you can go to those places. Like let's say we yeah. work a lot with scorpion toxins and you know, for scorpions, you don't go to Scandinavia, you go to the Sahara, you go to, to Asia. Right. Yeah, totally. That's fantastic. Um, okay, one more question. Is there a reference guide you recommend in spotting dangerous creatures for travelers? And maybe you can recommend, you know, venomous species or some of your favorite places that you've been. I'm sorry, a reference what? So guide? like a, a guide, like a great guide that you could recommend or, um, you know, a, a potential book for an, or just kind of top tips for actually spotting these venomous species if you're out and about. Well, if, if, you, if, if, if you go to a new location, let's say you go to head to Australia, South Africa or, or in India, uh, I would just recommend to buy, it, 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 it's hard because there are not many books which are saying venomous animals of Congo, or venomous <laughs> yeah. animals of Cameroon. So there are snakes of of Cameroon and then snakes of East Africa or reptiles yeah. of East Africa, but like which covers all of the venomous animals mm -hmm. is not that easy to find. For Southwest US, Arizona and, and, and neighboring states, for Australia, yes, you have plenty mm -hmm. of books like that. Uh, so I, I would just research the internet, venomous creatures and wherever you go, and, and, but don't be afraid, you know, the chances of somebody get bitten or stung uh, by a scorpion, snakes, jellyfish, it's not impossible or it's, it's, it's not zero, but it's extremely minimal, you know, if, if you're not chasing them. If, you, if, yeah. if, you, if you're unlucky, just go to the doctor, use your mobile phone and go to the <laughs> doctors as soon as possible. There we are from Zoltan to catch himself. And I would also say, if you are heading out in these environments, get to know all the animals, non-venomous and venomous, just to to give yourself a good idea of that environment. Zoltan, this has been an absolute joy. Thank you ever so much for coming on live. Thank you very much. Yeah, you've been fantastic. And this has been so fascinating. And of course, thank you all for tuning in live today. Um, we we powered through just the minor technical issues there. But remember, Zoltan is coming to us live from in the field with the beautiful Meadow Viper. So again, thank you all for watching. And we'll see you again next week here on the channel. Bye.